Let's now go to First uh, Peter, First Peter chapter two. Even though a couple of verses, quite a bit in them, but uh, just a reminder of this series we're going through. We started last year, the living hope in a hostile world, and certainly we want to know how to live in hope. We're reminded that, of course, that hope comes through the salvation that we have. That's what we've been learning as we go through this book, that we have wonderful blessings in Christ. And one of the things I've noticed in this book as we come even to this next section we're going to look at is, and it's, it's quite a common thing in the New Testament as well, that you start off, often Paul does this as well. He writes off, if you look at, say, Ephesians and Colossians and in this, this uh, letter as well, they begin by reminding us of all that we have in Christ, the blessings that we have in Christ, the, all of the, the wonderful uh, riches that we have in Christ as well. And then from that says, okay, now that you understand that, here's the way that you're to live. And so we look at the blessings and those blessings as we've seen already in this demand a response. That was in the first chapter. We, we noticed the first 12 verses reminded us of the blessings in Christ. And then the second part of the chapter said, okay, now that you know that, here's how you're supposed to live. And we notice here was a second, in the second chapter, a similar sort of thing. We've just been over the last couple of weeks realising some of the blessings, the privileges that we have in Christ. Remember, we looked at in verses 4 through 10, the fact that we can come to Christ, that we have this privilege of coming to Christ and we come to him as a living stone, the one that is the foundation of all that we do, all that we are in, in, in as Christians is Jesus Christ. And we're told that the life that we have comes from him. We looked at a little bit of that. And then last week, we looked at some of the blessings of union with Christ. Yes, we come to Christ for salvation. We continue to come to him for our daily life. And then as we go through uh, our life as well, we're reminded of the wonderful blessings that we have that we're united in Christ. And we said, Peter used some, some rich sort of word pictures there. He said that, you know, we are living stones because we're connected to that living stone, Jesus Christ. We're also a spiritual house. We're a priesthood and we're a chosen people, a, a holy nation. He said, a people belonging to God. We are people who've been uh, called out of this world and that we now um, uh, are people who have obtained mercy. And so there's some wonderful pictures that we notice in there. And now Peter is going to continue from that to now deal with, okay, how are we supposed to live? And this section, next section that we find, begins here in chapter 2, verse 11, and goes all the way through, um, some say to chapter 3, verse 12, some say goes all the way through to chapter 4, verse 11. So we've got a good chunk of the book. The body of this letter is really about, now that we understand all those things, Here's how we are to live. And of course, we know that the, the way that we're to live and the way he's writing this is in the context of suffering. He's writing to scattered believers, as we said, throughout the, what is now modern day Turkey. And we know the suffering that's going on in Turkey right now. But these were Christians who were suffering for their faith and they were scattered. And he wants to remind them and comfort them. And so what we will look at in these next couple of verses kind of set the scene for what he's about to move into in, in the instruction that he gives. So let's just read these two verses, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Peter's writing and says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Well, let's pray and then we'll have some time to look at those verses. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the reminder that we do indeed have a living hope in this world, which is becoming increasingly hostile, uh, hostile towards you, hostile towards us and hostile towards each other. But Lord, we thank you that our living hope is not in the things of this life, the people, the structures of this life. It's of course, in Jesus Christ and Christ alone, we thank you that he is our hope and he is not only our hope, he is our life as well. We thank you for the blessing of being able to come to him and we thank you for the blessings that we have being united with him. Lord, that we are now your children, your people. And Lord, as we take some time to think about this today, we pray, Lord, that we'll be reminded that those truths that we should know will, should also affect the way that we live in this world. 
And Lord, you've called us to stay and to live in this world for now. Lord, we look forward to the time when we'll be with you. But Lord, for the time right now, Lord, we know that each day uh, we need to trust you. And as we'll see today, each day can, can be a walk with you, but each day can also be a battle. And Lord, we ask for your help in that battle. And we also ask for your help in our testimony to the world around us. So just ask for your blessing as we consider these words in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, Peter is uh, writing to these believers, we know, and he's moving now from all of those truths that he's given them to now really appeal to them uh, in certain instructions. And we're going to read those in the coming weeks, and there'll be it's quite a number of them. But we notice first in this that he makes one sort of final appeal here to the believer's identity, who they are. This is the first part we want to look at, the believer's identity. You know, there's a lot of talk nowadays about ID, you know, having your ID and all this sort of stuff. And then there's all this other talk about identity. People saying, well, I identify as this, I identify as that. They, they kind of go, well, I want to choose how I identify. There's a lot of that going on at the moment in all sorts of different ways. And it's quite bizarre, we could say. Um, but the reality is it doesn't matter how I identify myself. What it really means is how does God identify me? And that's what we want to know. How does God, uh, how are we seen in the, in the Lord? And we've already looked at that, that we're the spiritual house, living stones, a chosen people. But Peter actually throws in a couple more here and really which will set the scene for, again, the way that we are to live. And he noticed that he uses a, a couple of terms here. He begins here by saying, dearly beloved or dearly beloved. Now, when you think of that, you probably think of, you know, something very formal, you know, the wedding. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today and all that stuff that we have for funerals and weddings and it's very formal. But this isn't like that. It's actually very affectionate. Peter is, is writing actually uh, as one who is, sincerely does love these other believers. Now, some of them he may have met and many of them he may not have met, but he can uh, remind them of two things. They are dear to him. They are dear to him because they are brothers and sisters in Christ. They are uh, fellow believers and they're also beloved, yes, by him, but also by God. And, and this is what we notice here is that Peter wants to let them know that they're dear to him, they're loved by God. And of course, Peter has already emphasized the love that God has for them. And really, this love is for all of us as well. And he reminds us back in chapter one, he says that we've been bought by the precious blood of Christ. We just had, took some time this morning to remember that in Lord's table, the, the blood of Christ. And God loved us so much that he sent his only son and his son shed his blood for our sin, laid down his life. And there's greater love as, really than no one can show than that. Jesus Christ demonstrated, God demonstrated his love through Jesus Christ. And because of that, and when we trust in what Christ has done on our behalf, when we recognise his payment for our sin and we place our faith and trust in him, we are now a people belonging to God. As we read this morning in Ephesians, we're accepted in the beloved, the beloved being Jesus Christ. God loved his son so much. And now because we are in him, we're accepted in him, that same love that he has for his son is extended to us as his children as well. And so we have also been told we received mercy and certainly we have. And these are ongoing things. It's not just a once off at salvation. We are always now the objects of God's love. In one sense, you could say all men are the objects of God's love, but we are the specific as his people, as his children. And this reminder to these believers who are scattered out, they're isolated, many of them. They may be together in small groups, but they're away from their homes. They've been driven out of their normal, uh, uh, where they've been, uh, is, should be a, a comfort to them, to know that they are loved, to know that they are accepted. And you know, it, it's, it should be as, as to us as well. The, the fact is, even in times of suffering, this is something that we should be reminded of. This is personally for each person to know that they're loved by God, but also that they're united with Christ and that we know as well that they are united together as his church. We looked a little bit about that last week. You know, I said in Genesis, God said that it's not good that man should be alone. And yes, that applies to marriage, but God also brings us together as his people. And that's why we gather together as a church. You know, 
uh, a lot of, in, in, sadly, in, in recent times, a lot of people have given off from, from being part of a local church. They figure that they can live the Christian life on themselves. And by doing that, they find themselves in isolation and they find themselves sometimes in despair and sometimes even they can find themselves going off, off track, off course, because they don't have a loving church family around them. I was reading the other day in Psalms and this, this kind of verse or part of this verse um, sort of jumped out at me. It says, God setteth, in Psalm 68 verse 4, it says that God setteth or placeth the solitary in families. You and I have been placed in the family of God. Yes, God is our heavenly father. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And even though at times you might feel like you're on your own, you're not, you're not on your own. You are, have fellow believers. And of course, you have a church family right here as well, a local church family. And I hope that you're thankful for your local church family. I am, I'm so glad that you're here, not just to show up to be people, you know, to be people in seats. That's not what we're talking about. You, each of you are, are brothers and sisters in Christ. You're dear, you're beloved. You're beloved by God and you're loved by myself and loved by each other as well. We, we notice that. And this is what Peter's really telling them. He's saying, look, you, I want you to know, reminded that you are the dearly beloved. You're loved by God. You're dear to me. And, and that really sets the affection for um, the, the sort of tone for what he's, that affection sets the tone for what he's about to now tell them. He says, dearly beloved, and then he goes on, uh, I, he says, I beseech you. And of course, the word beseech here means to be, uh, is, is the idea that you urge or you plea with someone, you're making an appeal. And the word here that we've seen before is the word parakaleo. Now, parakaleo is also used, often we talk about it, used for the Holy Spirit. It's the idea to come alongside. And Paul um, often uses this term, I beseech you. Peter uses it here. It's only in this verse translated, I beseech you. In chapter 5, a couple of times, it's called, I exhort you, I urge you. But the idea here is that Peter is not, um, he's not commanding his readers. You know, Peter's an apostle. And with that, apostleship has some authority. And he could say, I command that you do this. You know, here's what you're to do. By the Lord, I command that you do this. He's not, he's not doing that. He's actually coming alongside them and saying, look, I, I urge you. I, I plead with you. And he's appealing to their sense of what is right uh, as those who've been born again. He, he knows that they're able to do what he asks. One writer said that true holiness does not result from the application of external authority. Peter, later in this book, says that we're not to even, as God's shepherds, we're not to lord it over the flock. He says we're to be examples. And he says here, but it's not by the application of external authority. Do this, don't do that. It's by awakening and strengthening the personal desire of those being appealed to. In other words, coming alongside and saying, you know these things. Let me come alongside, let me appeal to you, let me beseech you, let me urge you. And that's what he's saying, I beseech you. And then he actually then continues to refer to them in two other uh, ways that remind us of our identity. He says, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Now, these two words are very similar. There's a slight difference between them, and that's why he's used the two of them. The word strangers really applies to someone, you could say, living in a foreign country. We call them foreigners. They don't have citizenship in that country that they're in. They're actually just there, you could say temporarily, as someone who, is, who doesn't have the, the same rights of citizenship as a local. And, you know, people travel around the world, as this picture shows, you know, often backpackers and things like that. They'll go to a, a foreign country. They're a foreigner. They are a stranger. There's a lot of other people around there that are, are natives, or you could say local to this, that, that country, but they're a foreigner. They're there. And he says, that's what you are. But not in terms of a, he's not talking about them in, in, in respect to, oh, you're foreigners in that land of Turkey and that, like those lands of Asia. He's saying you're foreigners in, in, in respect to this world. And then he notices he also calls them pilgrims. And the idea here is a pilgrim has a similar sort of context to it. But the, the thing of a pilgrim is someone who's traveling. They're traveling through. So here's this person who's a foreigner, they're a stranger, but they're traveling through. They're on their way to someone else. So they're on a journey. And a pilgrim is someone who's, they're not settling down. They're on their way to somewhere. And they're actually thinking about their final destination or their journey. This, 
this is not their home. We often, you know, that, that hymn that we think about, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. I was almost going to sing that today, but the idea is that we are just passing and moving through this life. And, and you know, if you and I, as we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a new citizenship. We are citizens of a new country. Um, yes, we, you might have an Australian citizenship or you might have a, a place on this earth, but really your true destination, your true citizenship, we're told, is in heaven. In, in Philippians chapter 3, we're told that, that our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven. Wherefore, we also look for the Lord and Saviour, uh, Jesus Christ. And so we are living this life. We're travelling through this life. We're interacting with this world, but we are not of this world. We, we actually have a, a destination that we can look forward to. So being pilgrims and strangers means that we are living not with a here and now perspective. We don't look around at everything and just get so tied up in, in this world and what's happening on. In fact, we have an eternal perspective. You know, we're told that we're not to set our affections on the things below, we're to set our affections on things above. And that means that we realise that we have an ultimate destination, but with that, all sorts of blessings and results. We see, we see by faith, something that is very real, but it's something that is not visible right now. It's, it's our eternal home. And, you know, it's, that's not just, as some people think, oh, that's clouds in heaven, strumming and all that sort of stuff. We know that's not that. It's ultimately that we will live with Jesus Christ. He's going to return to this earth. We're going to rule and reign with him a thousand years. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And it, we're told as we've studied Revelation that God will dwell with us and we will dwell with him. And all the problems of sin will be taken away. The presence of sin will be taken away and we'll live in a glorious eternity with God. That's what we look forward to. That's the wonderful thing that we look forward to. And, you know, this was the perspective of the Old Testament believers that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11. Let's just read what it's, it tells us about them. It says, these all died in faith. Remember all those people in Hebrews 11 it, it refers to. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, not in this life, but having seen them afar off. They weren't, their perspective was not here. Their perspective was eternal. They were... It says, and were persuaded of them. They knew that they were true and they embraced them and they confessed, here they are again, that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. See, they had this mindset and Peter's wanting us to have the same mindset. He goes on to say, but for they that, that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And then this says, and truly if they'd been mindful from, of the country from whence they came out, if their thoughts and their focus was just on this life, they might have had opportunity to return. They might have thought about, well, I'm just going to live for now. You know, I'm not going to think about heaven. I'm not going to think about eternity. But it tells us that they desire a better country. This country is nice. I like living in Australia. But I desire a better country. I hope you do too. It's a heavenly country. And in the fact, we're told that where God is not ashamed to be called their God. You know, there's no sin that gets in the way. It's not going to be wonderful. We'll never, have to, uh, we'll never have to say sorry for anything we've done because we won't do anything wrong. We'll never have to say sorry to each other because we won't offend each other. We'll be in perfect relationship with God, in perfect relationship with one another. And we will serve him, we'll worship him, and we'll be with him forever. And it tells us, for he hath prepared for them a city. We spent a lot of time looking about that city, didn't we, in Revelation. And this is the wonderful thing. This eternal perspective that we have, that we should have of, of what is to come. So being in pilgrims and strangers will change the way that we think about this world, the way that we live in this world, and the way that we relate to this, this present world. As we said, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. You know, it doesn't mean that we'll live however we want. You know, it doesn't mean to say, oh, well, this world doesn't matter, just live however I want. No, it actually <laughs> refines the way we live in this world because we understand that the way that we live in this world will determine rewards for us. It doesn't determine our salvation, but it will return rewards for us, rewards that we, we give back to the Lord. We're reminded in 2 Corinthians that, that because Jesus died for us, it says, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. You know, most people that live today, their life is about them. And this is becoming more and more the case. You know, there are some people that go, they, I understand, they devote their lives to others and serving others. 
but ultimately the world thinks about themselves. It's very much me-centered. That's, that's really what we're finding in the world today. He says that we should not henceforth live unto ourselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Our life is, is directed to uh, heaven. Our life is lived by dependence and faith in Christ. We came to Christ for, by grace through faith. We live the Christian life by grace through faith. But we also need to understand that we're going to face a battle in doing that. And that's the next part that we go on to here. And this really um, is this, the second part of uh, this, this verse in verse 11. It says that, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. We're in a war. We're going to find out that. I think you might realize that already, that when you become a believer, you enter into a battlefield. A lot of people think that the Christian life is just, hey, it's all easy, it's all great. No, there's a battle that's going on, and it's a battle that really is going to last the rest of our lives before we go to be with the Lord. Now, we'll look at, uh, understand a little bit about that battle in the moment, but notice the th first thing that he tells us is that we are to abstain. We're to abstain from these things called fleshly lusts. Now, to abstain means to say no to, to hold off, to restrain from. I don't want this. And, and you know, we, uh, people restrain from all sorts of things. They say, I, I, I abstain. I say, I abstain from alcohol. I abstain from sugary foods. I don't want this, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. All sorts of things that, that you may say, well, I, no, I'm not having that today. I, I know it's bad for me or whatever it is, and I abstain from it. We are, as you probably may not have realised, um, because we don't celebrate it, but we're into this season that uh, some churches celebrate called Lent. And I think, did it begin this week? I think it did begin this week. And it was like Pancake Tuesday. I miss Pancake Tuesday. I always get to love eating pancakes on Pancake Tuesday. Um, but that's the day when you get rid of all the, you know, all the, the leaven they say out of the house. And then Ash Wednesday, people in some of these churches, they go to church, they get some ash and they put it on their head and the cross and all this sort of stuff. And really what they're saying is for the next 40 days from Ash Wednesday right through to Palm Sunday, hence the little palm cross, what they do is they say, I'm going to abstain. I'm going to deprive myself of certain things. And they, they will get to choose the things that they're gonna, you know, I'm gonna abstain from eating certain things. I'm gonna abstain from maybe watching telly or whatever it is, social media, all these things nowadays they do. It. And I'm doing that so I can dedicate myself to the Lord. Now, there's, I suppose you'd say there's nothing wrong with that, but the idea of this is that, you know, you abstain, you're, you're really trying to gain some favor or prove that you wanna do this. Now, I don't know the motives of everybody that does this, but it's become very, it's very ritualistic in, in some churches. You have to observe Lent, you have to give up these things. Well, we, we don't do that um, because we know that that is in our own strength. We need the Lord to do it. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking some time to devote yourself to the Lord, but not, not in a religious or ritualistic way. We're to abstain from these things that we're told are called fleshly lusts. Now, the word is lust is actually just refers to our cravings and our strong desires. And it can be good desires or bad desires. So uh, that lusts part can, you know, we often think of, oh, it's just evil. It can be either way. But adding the word fleshly in front of it makes it very clear what it is. And what he's saying here is these are those lusts that are driven by that are come from our flesh. And when we talk about a flesh, we're not talking about this. We're not talking about a physical body. You know, our physical bodies can be involved in this, but really what it's talking about is our, our internal sensual nature. In fact, what it's talking about is our old sin nature. It's, it's saying that we, are, we, should not, uh, we should abstain from those desires that are driven by our flesh or our old sin nature. Now, we understand that we have an old sin nature that coexists with our new nature that we have in Christ. Now, just to kind of, I, I know that many of you know what I'm talking about with this, but I just feel I need a little bit of a brief explanation. Before receiving salvation in Christ, you and I, like every other person, had only one nature. That's our sin nature. Our sin nature came to us from Adam. Romans 5.12 says that wherefore by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all that have sinned. You and I and every person on this planet as descendants of Adam have inherited that sin nature and we are sinners by nature but we also sin by activity. You know, we, we do things that are sinful and when I say sinful we're saying 
things that are against God, things that are against God's word, things that are against God's law, and things that are in rebellion to God. So we live, in essence, under our own desires. We live under this sin nature. That's what happens to us and to every person before they trust in Christ. Well, when you trust in Christ, Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ for salvation, God places in you a new nature. The term is, we often use is born again. You are regenerated, as it were. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You now have a new nature dwelling in you. And God not only gives us this new nature, he places his spirit in us as well and so we had old desires that are driven by the old sin nature and now with this new nature we have new desires new desires to please god to live for god to obey him to a desire for his word a desire to live uh, uh, according to how he wants us to in a way that pleases him and god actually puts his holy spirit in us to enable us to do that the holy spirit is our helper he is our comforter he's the one that actually gives us the power to live the Christian life. We can't do it in our own flesh. Now, the thing to understand is that even though it says all things are passed away, it doesn't mean that our sin nature is eliminated. We are no longer under the control of it, or we know it's no longer our master. We now have two natures dwelling in us. We have the old sin nature and we have the new nature. And here's where the battle comes in. Here's where the war comes in. For every believer, your old sin nature wants you to live according to your own desires, to do what pleases you. But your new nature, which is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, wants you to do what pleases God. And so we have this struggle. Do I please myself? Do I please God? And every, we find we have to continually make that choice. Now, the Apostle Paul gives much attention to this in Romans chapter 6 through 8, and he also mentions about it in Galatians 5, and we don't have time today to sort of look at all of that. But in Galatians chapter 5, he mentions this war that's going on. He says the flesh, that's the old sin nature, lusteth against the spirit, the spirit being the one that's in our new nature, indwelling our new nature, and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary to one another. There's this battle going on so that you cannot do the things you would. What's that mean? Well, you want to please God, but very often we, we find that we don't. And this is why every believer we know, we are saved from sin, we're forgiven, but we're still sinners and we still struggle with sin. And this, while we're still in our earthly bodies, this side of, of going to be with um, the Lord, we have this battle going on between the flesh and the spirit. So how do you win this battle? Well, we can't do it in our own strength. That's the whole thing. He says, when you cannot do the things you would. A lot of people try to, try to uh, overcome the flesh by just saying, I'll try harder, I'll do better, I'll set up rules, I'll set up all these things, and I'll try to do that. And the problem is we continually fail. Now, understanding that the old sin nature isn't just about doing bad things. Sometimes it's about doing good things. And you think, oh, what do you mean by that? It's about doing good things in our own strength to somehow proclaim our own righteousness. And Paul in Romans chapter 7 talks about this. He talks about the fact that, you know, the things that I want to do, I can't do, and all this sort of stuff. And he gets to the end of it and says, woe is me. Uh, who shall rescue uh, me from all of this? And then he goes at the end to say, Jesus Christ shall. And then we get to chapter 8. And you'll notice his focus is off me, me, I, I, trying to do all this. And in chapter 8, his thing is about the spirit. And he talks about, you know, that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but walk after the spirit. And so the idea here is that we won't find ourselves continually in this pattern of, of, being, uh, of, of, of sin, of giving, caving, if we walk in the spirit. And he talks a lot about that. And this is exactly what he also says in the verse before this, he says, walk in the spirit. In other words, live day by day, walking in the spirit, depending on the spirit, and you shall not uh, fulfill the lust of the flesh. The way that we abstain from those fleshly lusts is to live to walk in the spirit. And what does that mean? It means day by day, recognizing that we cannot 
live this life ourselves. We cannot live the Christian lives ourselves. But, you know, we are no longer a slave to that old sin nature. We are now, as, as Paul says, we can reckon ourselves dead to sin. This is what he says in Romans 6. He says, likewise, you are to reckon yourself dead indeed to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's our position. We're dead to that sin nature. We don't have to obey it. It's like I mentioned before, you know, you maybe you rented a house uh, and you were renting a house and then you were paying your landlord for that rent for that house. And then you move to a new house or you buy a house and you've got a new landlord or you've got, you're paying to the bank. You don't have to pay the old landlord anymore. It would be silly for us to go, oh, well, you know, I used to live there. I better go and give him some money, right? What he's saying is, no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to bait. You're under a new master now. And our, of course, our master is Jesus Christ. So therefore, we're told, let not sin reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey the lusts thereof. Now, this isn't a matter of just let go and let God. Certainly, God is the one that does it. But God wants us to cooperate. And this is why Peter says, abstain. You need to say no to these desires. And, and the reality is, for many of us, this is the battle that we have. You know, when we become isolated, particularly from others, uh, very much so we find ourselves falling into these temptations. The last three years with all of the lockdowns and the isolation and things like that, many Christians have found themselves, some have found themselves growing in the Lord as they've drawn near to the Lord, but many Christians have found themselves actually in this struggle and have actually really, I guess you'd say, uh, have been overcome by fleshly lusts because they're by themselves and they go, no one sees me, no one knows what I'm doing. Of course, we know God knows what you're doing, but he, he continue and you just say, well, I'm just going to, I'll just indulge myself. And look at all the things that are going on around me. You know, it, life is hard. So I'll just indulge myself in this and this and this. And whatever they are, they're different for each of us. James says that those lusts, every man's drawn away by his own lusts. And so there might be things that, you know, for me, it's like maybe uh, eating another biscuit. <laughs> so sometimes I'm kind of getting carried away um, with, with all those sorts of things, sugary foods or whatever. It may, be, it, may be, uh, it may be physical lust. It may be all sorts of different things. Maybe anger, maybe all sorts of things. He says, you need to abstain from those things. Abstain from those fleshly lusts. And he actually says that they war against the soul. There's a constant battle going on in our life of this war. And this war, notice the word war, it's not a one-time battle. It actually means campaign, one after another and after another. We've We've just seen, what, 12 months of this campaign and this battle that's been going on in Russia and the Ukraine, and it's far from over. It's going to continue, and many believe it's going to continue on for years. In fact, it looks like it's going to escalate to a world war if it's not already there. Well, for us, our battle is not against people. Our battle is not against those things around us, but in, in reality, our, our battle is an internal one. That's the one that we have to remember. And so as we realise that we can... Overcome that by abstaining, by, you know, trusting God in all of this and, and allowing him to work in us, yielding our members to him. We will, as it says, as we walk in the spirit, this is what Galatians tells us that the, the results of that are. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. The flesh hasn't gone away, but we're just saying, you're dead to me. I don't need to obey you. And so every time a desire comes along that we struggle with, we can say, you know what? I know what, what Jesus has died for me, and I know that I am dead to that sin nature. So sin nature, I don't need to obey you, even though he's kind of tugging at you, you know, come on. He said, no, go away. Don't need you. I have the spirit. I have Jesus Christ. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. That's the reminder of that. And so, as I said, our battle is not against people. You know, uh, sometimes we do get in conflicts with people. I understand that. But our battle is not against people. Our battle actually begins internally in ourselves, And this is what he reminds us of. And just finally here, moves us, really with that, moves us to the next part. And verse 12 is, is not a new sentence. If you look at it, you'll notice that it's actually a continuation on. So he says, as you abstain from these fleshly lusts which are battling against your soul as you kind of undertake that battle and as you you gain gain some victory in the holy spirit it will mean a certain result outwardly to the way that you live the world and he actually says here this is our witness this is the way that we uh, present ourselves to the world having your conversation honest 
among the Gentiles. That's what he's reminding them of here. Their conversation really, of course, is talking about their lifestyle, their behavior, that word conversation. Um, we often think of it as, as speaking, but here it's talking about the way we live. And it's in contrast, and Peter actually mentioned in chapter one about a vain conversation that we used to have. You know, a vain conversation, it was an empty way of living. It was living for ourselves, living for this world, living for all the pleasures. He says, in contrast to that, you are living a different conversation and it's an honest conversation. Now, the word honest, of course, we understand it to be, you know, honorable without deceit, but the word here also means beautiful, good, that we're living a beautiful, uh, a good conversation, a good lifestyle, we have good behavior. And it's not that we're morally superior. It's not that we're saying that, oh, I'm better than you and I'm living all this. And it's not, it's actually what we're doing was we're just living in a way that understands who we are. We understand that we can, we can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, resist sin. And in doing that, we reflect the goodness of God and the holiness of God, the distinctness of God to all those who are around us. And this is where he mentions here having your conversation uh, honest among the Gentiles. The others around us are these Gentiles, and he's called Gentiles by Peter, and often we think of Gentiles just being non-Jews, but the word there is also ethnos or nations. Essentially what he's saying is yeah, Gentiles, we often in the New Testament also refers to unbelievers, the unbelieving world. So you and I, as dearly beloved, as those who are pilgrims and strangers, we live in this world and we're living, again, abstaining from these lusts. We have a lifestyle among the unbelievers that they notice, that they see. Unbelievers will observe in us or as we recognize our identity as we live this way they'll recognize in us the goodness or they'll see in us the goodness and the holiness of god now this of course it says here that we are to live among the gentiles so this reminds us that we're not actually supposed to isolate ourselves in some little monastery or some little commune or away from everything else you know we are to be separate from the world in a in a spiritual sense and in an emotional sense we're not to love the world but the reality here is that we're still to live in the world and god gives us uh you know workplaces he gives us schools he gives us homes families neighborhoods that we're to live in and these neighborhoods of course are surrounded by unbelievers the people around us and we are to be a light in those communities god wants us to be there just as he chose the old testament nation of israel yes he chose them as his special people but they were to be a light to the gentiles that the gentiles would see and say, what sort of God is this that has that these people that have such a God? And really, that's the same that should happen here. And Peter actually goes on to say that we are to, again, to be that holy, distinct uh, people in the world around us in, in, in light of all of that. And the way that we interact with people should reflect that. Now, it also says that these people will behold our good works. A little further down there, it says that they may by your good works which they shall behold and the good works we're talking about here are ultimately firstly our our the way that we respond to god our good works to god the way that we live for god the way that we as believers love one another and live for one another and then also that will reflect in the way that we respond to them as well and uh, the good works is not of course to give us salvation the good works is a result because we do have salvation now, he does also say here that with that, that we would, uh, in, in doing those good works, that we would glorify God. And Jesus reminds us of that. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The whole pur purpose of our, our, this sort of lifestyle and this sort of behavior isn't, well, look how good you are. Because the fact is, I'm not good. I'm a sinner. <laughs> I'm a sinner in need of a saviour and I want you to know him and I'm pointing you to him and I want God to be glorified in my life. And that's when we have that attitude. It says that by our good works that we would glorify your father which is in heaven. Now that doesn't mean that everybody's going to say, wonderful, look at how great God is. I love God. In fact, we're actually told here, Peter says to us that... Um, You'll notice it says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers. Often that's what they're going to do. 
You are living a life that is set apart for God. You're living a life and they're going to they're gonna say nasty things about you. And I'm sure all of you have faced that in your life. You've, you've, the moment, you know, in fact, I found the moment I came to Christ, there started to be opposition, opposition in my family because none of my family were believers, opposition from other people around. And, you know, I just, I was so excited. I love Jesus and I want to tell everybody about him. And so I felt like, well, why is everybody so mean? You know, um, you know, you've got this new nature and you says, love God. But the reality is, this is what happens. He says that they will speak evil again. They will speak against you as evildoers. And of course, today, all the more so. You know, there was a time back some years ago when, you know, you could say Christianity was, was looked at with a good regard. He's a good Christian man. He's a good God-fearing man. He's a church-going man. Nowadays, it's like snarl. It's like, you know, oh, you know, why would you do that? Or you Christians, you think this, or, you know, you, you're so bigoted. or so Because, of course, what the world has done is taken evil and called it good. And what God calls good, they say, is evil. Isaiah says that was going to happen in, in the Old Testament, and we even see that in Romans chapter 1 as well. That's the world we live in. Now, the, the reality of that is that that shouldn't detract us from the, the lifestyle we live, because we're not living it to show, we're not living it to them, we're living it to the Lord. We're living this conversation to God, and as we live that conversation to God, they will see. But it also mentions that as they see that, yes, they will speak against you, but they will also glorify God. Jesus, just in reminding us of that speaking against us, he said, Blessed are ye when, all, when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil uh, of you falsely for my sake. Notice that for my sake. Peter's going to say a little later on, if you're suffering for your own faults, hey, that's on you. If you're suffering because of your own obstinance and those things, but if you're suffering for me, Jesus says, rejoice. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. We have a reward in heaven. Don't look at this life. Don't focus on this life. You're a pilgrim. You're a stranger. You're on your way to heaven. Remember that. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And it actually goes on to say that there that they speak against you as evildoers, but they will still see those good works. They're still going to see that lifestyle and they cannot get away from it. And it actually says that they which they shall behold will glorify God in the day of visitation. What's this day of visitation mean? Well, there's two, two potential meanings for this. I think both apply as well. Firstly, what you'll notice is that people, when they keep looking at you, they keep reviling you, they keep thinking, oh, these Christians and stuff like that, some of them will actually notice and they'll say, you know what? Why am I saying this about them? They're really not. And they start to look at, they look at, their, look at our love for the Lord. And in fact, what happens is some will come to a point where they come to faith in Christ. I am so thankful in my life that God sent many believers along the way. If you know my story, I used to mock Christians. And I had a teacher in high school that used to bring his Bible. And when he went out of the room, I'd get up and grab his Bible, pretend to preach. I'm ashamed of that. Of course, God has a sense of humor and now I am a preacher. But, but, you know, I used to mock other Christians. I used to speak against them and this sort of stuff. But, you know, over time, I, they didn't respond in hate. They didn't respond in, in malice against me. And I was like, well, okay, that's interesting. And then I noticed other Christians. And I said, you know, they've got something. There's something about them, something that they have that I don't. And it helped me to recognize in that, you know, as God sent over the years, Christians. And at the time, I didn't realize it was only after I was saved that I was like, oh, okay, that's what he was doing. Um, that he, he sent people to help me to understand the goodness of God. And we're told that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And also my need for salvation. I recognized, hey, I'm a sinner. And it's not that they're so good. It's the fact that they have something that I don't. They have Jesus Christ and I want Jesus Christ. And ultimately it was in that case, that was my day of visitation. God came and met me and, he, and I received him as, uh, you know, for salvation. So that is one of the mentions of the day of visitation. And some people will do that. And we praise God. So our living our life, and you, you probably don't realize yourself, even just in the way you live, the way you honor the Lord, uh, that you are a testimony to others. And they may be calling you all sorts of things. Oh, you're going to church again, stupid, all this sort of stuff. But you know what? They're watching and they're watching 
and God's working on them and God is drawing, he's drawing people to himself and he's convicting them by his Holy Spirit. And they'll come to a point where some of them will go, okay, I understand now and I recognize I need that too. Now, there's a whole bunch of other people the day of visitation could well be talking about, and many think it is, and I think it also refers to this day of judgment. You know, every, we're told that there will be, for those who continue to reject Christ, that those who will not come to him and they continue to mock him, they continue to persecute uh, Christians, they're told, well, there'll be a point. God is extending grace towards them, can keeps doing that, but there'll be a point where that, that is ended and they will ultimately face judgment. Their judgment may not be in this life, but it says, we're told that every, everyone will, uh, shall appear in judgment before God. Now, for you and I, our judgment is before Jesus Christ at the Bema seat. We don't face a, a great white throne judgment, but as we read in Revelation, there will be a judgment for all unbelievers. And at that time, they will see the holiness of God. They will see the righteousness of God. It says that every mouth will be stopped. There'll be protests of, oh, yeah, but, you know, I didn't understand, or, you know, you're... You know, you don't understand me. You don't get me, right? He says, I know who you are, right? And we're told at that day that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in the earth and of things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, there's the glorifying God. And they will do it um, not in love for God, but in recognition of the fact that he is God, he is Lord, and they will still glorify God in that day of visitation. So for us, the reminder here, as we just think of those two verses, is that, you know, we need to understand who we are. We need to understand the battle that we're going through, and we're all facing that battle. It's, it's a battle that we uh, will face, but we can, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and also by encouraging one another, as Peter is, to, to have victory over that battle. And then as we live out our lives, understanding we are a testimony, a witness to the people around us. And as we continue through this chapter, Peter's going to give a whole lot of different ways on how this happens. And the first one coming up is a bit of a controversial one. It's about submission to authority, government authority, and all those sorts of things. And we'll look at that in our next message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, so thank you. Uh, we thank you for our time together today. We thank you for the reminder that we are loved by you. And that's not because we are lovely in any way. It's because your love is set upon us because you loved your son and you love your son. And because we're united with him, we, we know your love as well. Thank you, Lord, for the love that you show us the love that we don't deserve. And thank you, Lord, that we're, we're dear to you and we're dear to one another as well as God's people. Help us to remember that. Help us be as the ones who receive love to be loving to one another, to be dear to one another, as it were. And Lord, help us also to be reminded that this life that we're living right now, though there are some things we can enjoy and we do enjoy things in this life, Lord, help us to remember that we are but pilgrims and strangers. We're on our way to a better country, that heavenly country. Thank you, Lord, that we are citizens of heaven, not just citizens of earth. And Lord, as we live this life, we face the battles that we have, our battle against the flesh, Lord. We pray that we would be people that would learn how to walk according to your spirit, to yield ourselves to you. And that, Lord, as we live this life, Lord, would, we would indeed be a light to the world. And it wouldn't be for our glory. It wouldn't be so people would look at us. It would be people, the people would be pointed to you. And Lord, we know we'll have people that, that speak against us, that even seek maybe to harm us, Lord, but help us to entrust ourselves to you, knowing that you who've begun that good work in us will be faithful to complete it. We will go to be with you. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.